My name is Alexander Pole. I am a postdoc at the uh, Ruhr University Bochum in Germany. Um, actually, the research that we will talk about uh, started during my PhD at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. Our study in PRJ is uh, about some of the oldest fossil cephalopods uh, from the late Cambrian, uh, which belong to a group called uh, the Plectronoceratids. Uh, and we describe a new species uh, from uh, from the Ninmaru Formation at Black Mountain in Western Queensland, Australia, uh, based on more than uh, 200 specimens, which uh, in terms of numbers, uh, it kind of exceeds the entire previously known record uh, of Plectronoceratids uh, worldwide. What is quite remarkable about this is that they were already collected during the 70s and 80s uh, by an Australian paleontologist, uh, and a uh, former curator of the Queensland Museum um, called Mary Wade, uh, together with her team. She, she did quite important uh, preliminary work, but she never actually published uh, this uh, fauna. Um, and so this is kind of our uh, kind of our attempt to kind of continue her legacy. And we, we have some old kind of notes and, and very early uh, stage drafts from her. And we also uh, have some old, very interesting old letters. Um, uh, she act never actually uh, published this material before her death in uh, 2005. Um, and so, so yeah, and she wasn't from old letters. We know that, that she was in contact uh, with uh, kind of the top experts of that time. Uh, and so, so they already they, they already knew about the existence of of this material, and she also very very briefly mentioned it in some of her publications. Yet somehow all of this went forgotten in the more recent literature. And if you look at, at kind of more recent papers, you never find any mention of uh, uh, Cambrian cephalopods from Australia. And so that's kind of where where we we started. Uh, and and. The, the specimens are interesting not only because of kind of the, the number of specimens, but also uh, because they reveal some interesting structures that that were not recognized in in other plectronoceratids. And with this, we could essentially um, show that uh, many of the previous uh, previously established species of plectronoceratids were actually based on on differences that result from preparation techniques rather than from um, real biological differences. And I think we can talk, later talk a little bit more about this in, in detail. Um, but essentially, this allowed us to really revise the entire uh, taxonomy of the group um, and reduce the number of species of, uh, from, from about 68 uh, down to 11. And this, this also includes uh, our new species, which we, I think, quite appropriately named after Mary Wade. It's called uh, Sinoeromoceras Mary Wadey. <laughs> so most of the previously known species of uh, Plectronoceratids uh, come from uh, North China. And the problem with many of these specimens is that they were embedded in quite hard limestone. So they were very difficult uh, to, to prepare, actually. Um, and so for the, all of these early cephalopods, it is important to know uh, the, the internal structures. Um, so what we usually do, we do sections to really see kind of the shape of the, and they all have kind of the chambers and then there's uh, the siphuncle that connects these chambers. This is uh, essentially a tube that kind of is running through and this can still be seen in the modern day Nautilus. Um, so, in the case of the Chinese plectronoceratids, uh, they produced sections, and in many cases, like thin sections. So you have kind of a 2D image of what is actually a 3D specimen. And the problem here is that the, the siphuncal in, in the plectronoceratids, as we could show with the Australian material, is, is very complex. So for most cephalopods, uh, or actually all other cephalopods apart from plectronoceratids, the, the, the siphuncal is actually more or less radially symmetric. So you can imagine this as like maybe um, you have kind of a string of, of spheres and then if you make a, a section through it, no matter if you're kind of slightly off from this kind of the ideal uh, symmetry plane or kind of rotated, 
he will always have a rough idea about how how it actually looks like in in, in 3d even if you only have a 2d section um and as we realize now for the plectronoceratids it, it, it is much more complicated because um the structure is more like um more or less kidney sh kidney shaped and there's also strongly tilted and so if you had a kind of a cross section you would always cut more than one uh, of, of these segments and then you also in addition have another part of this segment um which kind of overlap overlaps with kind of extended and overlaps with the previous segment so it's it's very complex and it's better to show we have some of the uh in the paper that you can see it um um but anyway from this you can imagine if you have a section that is kind of slightly placed off the symmetry plane or even like um like rotated you will get something that looks very different depending on how you place the section and if you would even assume that this is like in other plectronoceratids that uh, or in other cephalopods uh, that the siphuncle is more or less radially symmetric you would reconstruct a, st a 3d structure that changes quite frequently in the shape uh, of its segments uh, uh, and so for this read that was also what 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 happened to previous kind of studies on these plectronoceratids that they thought like there were very frequent changes and we could we could show that the change is actually not happening between the segments but the change is actually happening within a single a single segment and so yeah and this uh, was kind of the basis to really uh, kind of simplify this whole system and, and show that many species many of the species cannot really be distinguished from each other and so we have kind of a much much more manageable uh, number of species and something that kind of makes more um, more sense from a biological perspective and at the same time we could also show that there are still some differences when you compare uh, different populations or species in this case from different areas so you you do see some some kind of uh, differences in, in size for example between in these old collections or you, you can always find kind of new surprises that kind of help you understand uh, maybe an old problem um better and and sometimes you can even find like uh small hints about this in in old papers as in my case i learned this from from a paper by mary wade from 1988 and just like a little little piece and then i was like yeah okay <laughs> so it's always worth like checking these to find some like new information which can lead to like uh, completely new projects and another thing is of course yet yeah, like like now we have kind of much more manageable system for for these plectronoceratids we have kind of a better understanding of of how how the diversity looks like um yeah and and last but not least i think it's very important to take into account like um the three-dimensional structure and not always like draw a conclusion from a single 2d sections and with many of these old cephalopods we far too often look at only like a like a single cut and then we draw a conclusion from that and not really take into account how how this relates to the 3d structure <laughs>